So coming up on Mount Hermeneutics, Christianity, is it true? So we're going to go ahead and lay out the case and uh, maybe bring up some few objections uh, that are common and uh, see where we go from there. That's what's coming up. So keep it right here. You're listening to Mount Hermeneutics, where three Marines give their perspective on God, faith, and spirituality with a heavy lean on the divine council worldview. This is not your grandma's Sunday school, nor is it always for the Christian faint of heart. Nothing about who we are or what we say make us experts. But you better believe we'll have a take, and perhaps it won't suck. I'm apparently a, uh, I'm, I'm bi-polytheist curious or something. I don't know. So Matt's wrong. It 100%. Fellas, what's happening? Yo, Ray, how are you? I'm all right. So, you know, as of this recording, it's, it's what, uh, November 12th? It is. So this, yep. this weekend was Veterans Day weekend and uh, even more important, uh, Marine Corps birthday weekend. So uh, it, it's always cool to have two days in a row, right? As, as right. Marines, I, I get, I get to welcome people for my service <laughs> two, two days in a row. So I've always told my employers, uh, my managers, my colleagues, I'm like, Hey, um, you don't get a choice on whether or not I take veterans day off. I don't take it off because I'm a veteran. I take it off because it's recovery day for Marine Corps birthday. <laughs> That's right. And, and they usually <laughs> don't know the Marine Corps birthday is the day before, et cetera. Right. right. So I have to explain that to them. And then they're like, Oh, okay, whoa, 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 I, the I holiest didn't. day of the calendar. Absolutely. Right. So I'm just like, <laughs> just, just so you know, like it's not, this isn't optional. This is how, it, this is what's going to happen. It so can, we, uh, we, we, we we passed on the on the ball this year. We went last year, you know, yeah. being retired for five years. Right. Um, but we did, you know, we dressed up a little bit and went down to. Was the this gas your lamp. first ball to miss in oh, in a period? Yeah. Is it? Well, no, 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 no. We I I don't think we didn't go for the the first five years of me being retired. So. Oh, okay. You just went. Yeah, yeah. I did. So last year was the first, first time I oh, went. I gotcha. Which was which was kind of kind of cool. Um, and it's also, you know, I, I work in a Marine unit now. So, you know, as, as a contractor, so it's, it's cool to jump in on theirs and, you know, Delani always likes it. Right. But uh, we went with a, another couple uh, that, that are veterans and we went down to a nice steak restaurant in, uh, in the gas lamp and got a nice, got a nice, nice piece of meat there. And, nice. And uh, got a, got a little bit, a little bit of drink, a little bit of, a little bit of conversation, a little bit of, a little bit of funness. Yeah. And then you uh, Yesterday was my cousin's uh, 40th birthday party. Shout out, Sarah. And, uh, you know, we went to her house. And, of course, Delani, the party planner, we uh, we brought some tables and chairs to, to hook that up. And, uh, Which means you have to work. Yeah. Her, uh, <laughs> her husband uh, hooked her up with a with a singer from church. And he, you know, brought his guitar and, and played some played some stuff. And it was it was a, it was a good time. Also, a, a local politician was there. And that was that's always a fun conversation. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a, a a school board guy running for state assembly, and you know, that's and some, you put the what, you put the screws to him. You, what, uh, that's right, Dre in California. What does state assembly mean? Is, uh, that, is that your law? Is that your lawmaking body? Lawmaking body. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you guys don't call it Congress; you call it the assembly. Yes. Okay. I, I hope that's true. <laughs> Otherwise, if you live in California, you know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's, if it's, it's not true, idiot. somebody's gonna let us know in the comments, yeah, like, right? No dumbass. But yeah, uh, District 75 down here in San gotcha. Diego. So. But yeah, that was my weekend. What's up, Brian? How you doing? I'm all right. I didn't do much for Marine Corps birthday. I uh, I, I binged half of the Pacific, the wow. HBO series, <laughs> and uh, yeah, John I've seen Mastelone. it before. Shout out. Yeah, I've seen it before, but I just I just got a hankering to review it, and yeah, Mine that brings up have, a uh, that begs a question: which is better, the Pacific or Band of Brothers? the pacific you think i mean i'm partial because that's well, of that's course our, total total oh, oh, bias that's our, that's our of people. course uh, i just think as, they're, as they're different I. but i think the band of brothers had a better cast interesting um okay all right cast of, of actors not of soldiers i'm not suggesting the soldiers in the in the band of brothers are superior to john basilone and company yeah i mean <laughs> i drive down basilone road often right okay and uh, I I get motivated every time I drive down. So, <laughs> rah, You're rah, yeah. But uh, yeah, kind of kind of made me miss the Marine Corps, but also kind of made me uh, glad I was just in for that one uh, 
that one golden period of, of American history when absolutely nothing in the world happened that <laughs> required the, the intervention of Marines. And then, uh, and then I got out and then, uh, then nine 11 happened and, right. uh, <laughs> I was already cynical and uh, jaded and turned off to ever working for the government again. So, but that's, um, that's funny. Yeah. I, uh, I had a, I had an interaction uh, at a, a VA appointment, long story short with a doc who was, he had a, a Eastern European accent and I'm sitting there as he's talking. I can't like, I, Dracula. I, I, I don't hear a word he's saying. I'm just thinking like, is Dracula about to pop out? Is this dude Romanian? Like I couldn't place the accent. I finally just asked him. He was Serbian and he was conscripted into the Serbian civil war. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, so he's, and he's kind of old. And I'm like, <clears throat> and I said, are we talking like, like early nineties Serbia war? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. But long story short, he had been conscripted as a doctor. And they needed mm. surgeons. And he was a general practitioner, uh, internologist by trade, actually. And they had him doing um, like like basically prepping wounded to be med, med, med flighted to like the rear. And he was like, it was a disaster. And he's just telling me all these stories. And it's like scary German guy because <laughs> he's talking to me. Anyway, that was that was the extent of the, my military involvement over the last week. Um, I didn't do anything this weekend. Carrie's out of town. She's in DC. Um, so she actually had a neat veterans day. She got to, she's in, doing this uh, women's veteran leadership program. It's like well-sponsored by Northrop and Boeing. And so they fly them out for, they pay for it. And she stayed at the Westin and they went and had dinner at the new women's veteran memorial down mm. in dc so she's had pictures of that and that kind of stuff so she she had a cool veterans day and i just hung out and uh went and uh i acquired nba 2k24 so i can uh, scratch my spurs um love itch by uh learning how to play video games again and that game is really complicated mm. <laughs> for anybody that's never played an nba 2k game like i'm a madden guy um i can pick madden up out of my sleep and like wreck people that game is like trying to you have to memorize all the moves to mortal Kombat while you're playing basketball is essentially how that game works because like every move is like a, you have to roll the cursor this way and hold this and time that and then release it just the right time and stuff it's crazy hard mm. um so anyway that's that's pretty much what i did this weekend all right so uh we're gonna we're gonna get into it but before we do if you could kindly hit the subscribe button or if you're listening on any of the other places like Spotify or Apple podcasts, you know, leave a, leave a review. And, uh, I, uh, you can, you can get to me at, at super Dre Instagram and, uh, Brian, man, what, what, how's Christianity true? <laughs> Just jumping into it, huh? Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> how is Christianity true? It's always, uh, it's always tough to know how to, to where, where to start with that. So I guess I'll just, uh, just to just to you know to preface this, this is I'm going to make like an opening statement. I'm going to kind of sum up the case for it. Um, this is not in itself the comprehensive case. It's just kind of a drive by on my overall case. So you guys you guys might want to object at, at certain points in this, but I'm going to ask you to just kind of indulge me for a few minutes, and uh, then you can you know come at me after. And for those that just heard that, Brian said this is not the the full version. So three hours from now, when you recognize all the things we said, and this isn't the complete version, this is a heady topic. And I don't say that mm -hmm. to disparage or cast any kind of aspersions ahead of time. I'm saying that there's volumes of books written on this topic. Oh, I feel attacked, but uh, yeah. I shouldn't. I know, but okay. So here, here goes. Um, there are four main arguments from natural theology or what we now call classical the uh, classical apologetics that uh, I wouldn't that that I rely on that I wouldn't I wouldn't say they prove God's existence to any degree of final settled certainty, but they at least make they they at least make belief in God more reasonable to believe than not because um, some of, some of them their premises aren't falsifiable. So their, their, their premises are probable, but they're not, we're not certain about them. So I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't say that they prove God's existence, but they at least they should at least create a pro-God bias. And those are the cosmological argument, which to um, well, I'll run through them and then I'll tell you what they are. The cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, and the argument from consciousness. Um, the cosmological argument, it's basically uh to to put it really quickly and just do a drive-by. Um, everything that has a beginning has a preceding set of causes, has a, has a preceding cause, and a cause is always greater than an effect. The universe had a beginning, which means the, the universe had a preceding cause that is greater than the universe. Since the universe is all of nature, um, whatever caused the universe is by definition supernatural. Um, the, the teleological argument is based on uh, the observed fine-tuning of the universe, which is not a, which is not a religious term. That's the term physicists use to observe that the the fundamental constants of the universe had to be lined up just so in order for life on this planet to be possible. Which and you you find the phrase apparent design in a lot of their literature. Uh, Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, he uses this phrase, um, acknowledging that there is a a design that is apparent to the universe. Um, design requires a designer. The for for the universe to be fine tuned to purpose, that requires a mind, which means that supernatural cause of the cosmological argument is conscious i.e. God. Uh, the moral argument is essentially that uh, morality by definition is an obligation to behave a certain way. And when you start asking, well, obligation to whom, um, it, it, it points to an authority over and beyond man to whom we are accountable. And if that, uh, if that authority doesn't exist, then morality itself sort of implodes and um nobody can really live that way the argument from consciousness is uh i don't use it as a positive argument for god's existence it's more of a it's more of a rebuttal to a, a popular objection to god's existence which is um if god exists you should be able to prove him with science um but consciousness itself isn't provable by science we only we only know about it because we are conscious um a few weeks ago i quoted an excerpt from sam harris's the the end of faith when we when we talked about ai um where he explained he makes a really ironically a really great case for faith by explaining that uh there's nothing about a brain as a physical system that de that declares it to be the bearer of consciousness um so in short um i don't want to get too much so, into a hey brian the weeds so, with that so, so since you went over them and you kind of laid them out state them again just for for record keeping because just for simplicity of sure. sorry, what was what was the first one the cosmological argument okay the teleological argument the moral argument and the argument from consciousness and, and, and this is just the argument that God exists, not necessarily any particular way to worship him. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, and it's, uh, yeah, just that, and it, and it, to reiterate, just because I, I don't, I can't overstate this. I am not claiming that these prove God's existence. They make it, they make God's existence more reasonable to believe in than not. It, it should, it should create a pro God bias. Um, it should it should tell us that it just it makes sense to live as if God exists and to pray to him and ask for for guidance, for confirmation, for additional evidence, and to be open to that evidence should it present itself. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't say that these settle the question of whether God exists. Uh, um, like it's at least enough to answer the common new atheist uh, trope that the belief in God is so ridiculous that that uh, theists should be mocked into 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 hiding and silenced in public, um, which is really not a reasonable position at all. It, but believing in God is actually pretty reasonable. Um, but there's a fifth argument: the the historical case for the resurrection, 
which I would which I would insist uh, is conclusive. It does prove that you you can prove from the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, if Jesus rose from the dead, only the source of life, i.e., God, could do that. This uh, this validates Jesus as the Messiah and validates the overall biblical narrative that foretold him, and uh, and then in turn ratifies those four arguments, taking them from um, more reasonable to believe than not to relative certainty. And uh, so I I realize there's a at least five different cans of worms that are there to be open from that. Um, but that's the gist of it. So from there, I would usually focus my attention on the, res on the argument from the resurrection since that's the most decisive. So. Okay. So <clears throat> that that's a lot. And for anybody yeah. listening that is new to philosophy or formal theology, um, there's a lot of $10 words layered in there, right? So what, what makes sense? Does it make sense to, to dig into a few of these? I mean, I think you kind of buried the lead, right? You kind of said there's these four primary approaches or arguments and then to be, <laughs> to back up. So in the world of philosophy, the word argument doesn't mean to bicker, right? It means to present a case and to present a position. Right. So just for anybody listening, um, <clears throat> that's kind of the way we're talking here. We're, we're actually not going to argue these points in the sense of, hey, you dummy. It's going to be, you know, it's more like, hey, this is what this means. And then we're going to have a discuss. where, you know, we'll discuss around it to a certain degree. Um, but let us know in the comments, one, <clears throat> if this kind of conversation is too deep in the weeds, um, if we don't go deep enough, if you want, maybe we could, I was just thinking as Brian was kind of going over these, if the, if it's worth it and we get the feedback, we could do an individual episode on each of these individual arguments um, and kind of, we could flesh them out a little more heavily, kind of like we did on the, the Trinity discussion where we spent a lot of time and, you know, spent some real serious focus on it. Um, otherwise, you know, to cover five arguments in, you know, an hour and a half, two hours is going to be very, very superficial. Um, so that's kind of my my follow on thoughts to that but yeah and 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 again i don't i i wasn't planning on diving deep into all five right but i right. i think we should spend some time on the resurrection since that's the that's the linchpin of everything sure in in, in sense that's a one particular way to worship god so that's <clears throat> christianity and that's where it started and that's where where it comes from and all the other stuff which is a premise of building hey this is god Okay, so now that we have established that God perhaps exists, now the uh, the resurrection which, is kind of, kind of a big deal. Well, it's kind of like you know if you're starting from the position of a of a agnostic, right? And you're like you're like got your arms crossed and you're like, why should I believe in God? And you're like, well, and then you go through these four, you know, the the cosmological, the te teleological, etc. If by the time you're done with that, the person says, hmm it's probably more likely than not likely that God does exist, which God exists, right? Like that's, right. that's, that's where the, the, the historical case for the resurrection becomes, you know, a more relevant conversation. Cause I think my personal opinion is if you were to walk up to Joe, the atheist and just start having the historical case for the resurrection, it's probably going to be an uphill conversation. Right. But if you plant a few different seeds to get at least the arms to uncross and for the person to kind of lean forward and go, okay, you may be onto something. There could be a God, but which God, right? Is it the Hindu God? Is it the the Taoist God? Is it the 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 Islamic God? Is it the you know the Jewish well, God? That's a different I would, conversation. I, I I bring up those four arguments because if if the Bible is true, um, the biblical writers always they write as if there there's there's knowledge about God that is more fundamental than the Bible. Like in Romans one, Paul talks about how um, God, God's existence is known from creation um, that he, that it's, it's his, his existence and his power and his nature are evident from what has been made. And he also, he also alludes to the moral argument when he says that Gentiles 
who do not have the law, who do by nature the things required by the law, show that they are a law unto themselves, showing that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Um, so if that's true, then you should be able to establish God's existence up outside of the Bible just based on observation. But I would also add that um, the question of which God... Um, the, these kinds of arguments, like the like the cosmological argument, does not lead to the Hindu God because the the, the God of Hinduism is the universe. Um, it doesn't. Uh, so, so they would have their own cosmological argument. Well, I don't. I don't know that they do, but uh, but the, the I've, cosmological. I've never, I've never met a Hindu. I've never met a Hindu apologist before, so I don't know. I don't know what, I don't well, know how they, I've met like very the, Krishna apologists, but not a Hindu apologist. Well, the, you know, we've, we've discussed this in previous uh, episodes about how there's, there are only two religions in the world, ultimately, um, pantheism and monotheism. Um, all of these arguments lend themselves to monotheism, not pantheism. Um, and, and Hindu, like the moral argument, um, doesn't really work within hinduism i don't i don't know how familiar you guys have you guys ever read the bhagavad gita or i i i actually have it on my bookshelf oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so have, have you read it no okay <laughs> well the, actually uh, i have some things that highlight right here <laughs> are you making fun of me right now I have, a, I have a bookmark in it right here this is where i was reading last time i read it okay and you can are you see making there, fun of me right now there's words in the page I am. Okay. hundred <laughs> percent. Okay. So the, the Bhagavad Gita, it's a subsection of a larger epic poem called the Mahabharata, but it's, it's kind of the Bhagavad Gita is kind of the most important part. The setup for this is there's a prince named Arjuna. He's about to go into battle against a, a, a rival clan who are his kin, his kinsmen. And he's, he's lamenting that he's there. There's going to be this massive slaughter. His charioteer is a guy named Krishna, who, as it turns out, is an avatar of Vishnu, the second person of the Hindu Godhead. And he commences to explain to him that um, because everyone and everything is Brahman, is is basically identical, identical to God, that the individual identity is an illusion. Um, this idea of, e of good and evil is likewise illusory. Um, that it's that's just thinking of anything in terms of good and evil is as illusory as thinking of yourself as an individual um distinct from brahman and so since everything is brahman it doesn't really matter in gandhi's commentary on the bhagavad gita he he makes the illustration of uh and in, in <clears throat> from the perspective of brahman a a surgeon cutting out a tumor and a murderer killing a victim is is ultimately there's actually there's no moral distinction between those. Um, so, just as an example of how the moral argument doesn't really lend itself to the Hindu God, because morality itself sort of it it's just it it's part of the uh, the illusion of that keeps us trapped in samsara. Um, so, I mean, the bottom line is that the, these arguments, the question of, you know, which God do they point to, um, th there's that popular uh, new atheist trope uh, that you guys might have heard. Um, uh, Christians are atheists when it comes to the the 20,000 other gods that are, that are out there. Atheists are just uh, atheists about one more. And the, the suggestion being that polytheism and monotheism are basically the same thing it's just polytheism is more of the same which is a total misapprehension of what's being discussed um <clears throat> the idea that there's really only one religious tradition that points to a a transcendent eternal god who is beyond the universe and that's 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 the biblical tradition and everything else is either everything else within that tradition is either a corollary or an offshoot or a heresy and then everything else falls under the pantheism category and so just to reiterate these four arguments really only point to to 
one kind of God and the God of the Bible is the, is the, uh, the only one that resembles that God. Well, so. I, well, I mean, without getting into a hair splitting, I would, I would suggest that the ar- the argument from consciousness w- could support any of the other monotheistic religions, but that's, I get your point that the others don't, but that one, that one doesn't seem to be uh, monotheistic centric. At least okay. something that I, I understand about it. I mean, I'm just, I, I, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's a, it's a hill worth getting on and fighting, fighting over, but I get your point. Yeah. And it's, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on that, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So um, do you guys have anything else to say about that or should we get into the resurrection? I, I mean, I, I personally don't like these arguments at all. Why? Before. I mean, I can do them line by line, but broadly, um, if any of our recurring listeners might have heard me use the term wizard's duel before. And these types of conversations lend themselves to very esoteric, philosophical, overly educated, pedantic logic debates that to me have absolutely nothing to do with religion. And everything to do with I'm smarter than you, haha! I can prove it. Um, and I would suggest that if I was an atheist, and if I was older than I don't know 25, and someone attempted to use these arguments as a way to browbeat me into accepting their religion, it would actually cause me to go further away from it, because I would simply become emotionally t- cut off from the discussion. Hmm. That's why. Um, I, I, I find them to be um, uh, trying to find the right sophisticated word to explain it. Um, I, I, I think, I think Brian, you know, when he, when he, when he started that, that it, that he, you know, he came up forward and said, this is not proof for. Oh, I, I get it. I'm not attacking right. Brian yeah, with so, it. I, I, I right, just, just, he asked a question and I was like, yeah, like okay, my response yeah. is I don't like this stuff. That, right? it, like, that well, stuff would lean you to be more of a God bias. If I, if I was already not right. a Christian, right. If or I even wasn't many already... gods. Right. So it, sure. I, I think, I mean, it, and there's, there's, there's steps in between monotheism and, and polytheism. You don't have to, because what is it? Uh, Molitary or uh, Mol- Molin- Mol- Molism or Molinism or however, whatever it Molinism. is. Molinism. Molinism. Yeah. I don't, I'm not Molitary. sure that's. Molitary. So the, the worship of, of one God without denial that there are oh, others. Mo- mo- monolatry. Sure. Monolatry. Oh, mon- there monolatry. There you go. Well, that's a, that's, that's a new one for me. <laughs> well, the, the thing is though, if you're, if we're talking about multiple gods, the, uh, polytheistic religion it typically sees uh or or henotheism well yeah polytheism typically sees the gods as personified forces of nature um i I don't think these other words do well when you talk about henotheism like in the in the sense of like canaanite religion like there's you have you have l at the top of the pantheon where she's ruling over Baal Hadad and Ishtar and and uh, Moloch and and the rest that those are picturing the gods as personified forces of nature. It's this idea that nature has agency and it they're <clears throat> like you know if if it's a bright sunny day out and a storm a storm system rolls in and blocks out the sun, where well, that's Zeus exerting his dominance over. No, I, I I understand that, but I I think there is a a line of thought that that argues against that, and I, I don't I don't know if if right now was appropriate to get into that conversation, but I I think that there is uh, a, a school of thought that that Yahweh was a lesser being to L, and then at some point they conflated them both, and 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 in that that thing kind of kind of happened. So, um, well. A lot of ancient alien theorists are kind well, of on that plane as well. There has the, nothing to do with personification of of forces of nature. It's an actual god and his consort bringing on well, other there, gods. There's an academic school of thought that that 
um, argues that Yahweh, Yahwism, or what we would call like proto Judaism, what became right. the religion of the Bible, that this that this developed over time mm -hmm. out of polytheistic religion, that's that's not really that's predicated on the assumption that it's man made. They don't. It, it's not that they. It's not that they have positive evidence for this. This is the theory by which they account for the existence of the, the the Israelite religion within the context of polytheism. But but you're but we're still talking about a, a worldview that that sees them in terms of personified forces of nature. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I don't I'm, I don't I don't know if we're going to get anywhere with with that. I don't I don't think so. I, I think I think often yes, but I I think this argument in particular. I don't think so. I, I, I think I, I think people know shit think that L was a god and L had other gods and you worship. Well, yeah, and I'm, one I'm not. That it's not, not necessarily a, a you know a personification of 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 natural forces. And and ancient aliens you know, theories of of that type of thing are are exactly that. Well, so hang on though. So if we're gonna if we're gonna keep. In this con in the context of this conversation, and keeping in the theme of the divine council worldview, right? The going back to the 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 sequence in the Bible with with uh, Moses and Pharaoh, let my people go, all that stuff, right? The way I understand that set of events is that those the 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 were there seven plagues? I forget ten. the number. Ten. The, ten the, each each of those plagues were specifically chosen by God to essentially be a flex on the pantheon of Egyptian gods that were worshipped by Pharaoh and his people at the time. Right. Right. The Nile so, was a god. There was a the, right. Uh, right. And and was, Keck was a uh, frog god, and... right? And so he was like, "I got, I heard you like frogs, dog. So I got frogs with your frogs, right?" Like he's like, "Oh, your god does frogs. That's cute. Watch this. You have a god that does fire. Watch this. I'm gonna have ice fall with fire inside of it because I can take your ice god and control your fire god, and I can do both because it's like whatever. This is boring to me, right? Like that's I'm I'm hyper simplifying, but that's kind of the way that I understand that it, those events to have occurred. But I think it's it's fair to point out that you know much like within that wizard's duel that happened with Moses and the and the pharaohs uh, or was it was it was it even Moses it was the other guy um guy that Aaron. was with Moses Aaron right and and pharaohs wizards like they had a wizard's duel snakes eating snakes and sticks turning into snakes and whatever and then all of these things happened it's funny when Dudley Moore did it in front of Richard Pryor. That was actually <laughs> but to frame this under the concept of the divine council worldview is to kind of accept that these things actually are out there. So I, otherwise we wouldn't have been given to the nations, right? Right, right. So, and the only reason I'm, and this, and I'm, this is where, you know, and I'm sure Heiser does a much better job of it or did a better job of it than, you know, any of us specifically, I'm able to kind of restate this. And this is why so many people that don't buy into the DCW use that polytheistic kind of slur to, 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 to say, you know, DCW's, you know, it's, it's fake, it's, it's not Christianity, whatever. But it's it's about lowercase g gods versus capital G God and whether or not they actually exist. But that existence doesn't make them valid, right? So there's a difference between or, right, or what, rate the, worship. Well, that's what the, I was about to say. The DCW the, is an alternative to that kind of pagan polytheism. It's not a validation of it. I, I think it is though. I, I, it, to be to be honest, it's it's a validation in the sense that it exists in the plane of reality. Well, but what, okay, let me but, let me explain to, what to I complete. Mean but hang on, to complete my thought was what Dre just said is the existence of these <clears throat> lowercase g gods Elohim. Just because they exist, that doesn't make them worthy of worship and praise, and that's the difference, and that's the miss, right? So to say that. You know, these other things aren't real. I think cloud, I think when we say that, that we broadly, I'm not saying you, Brian, or whatever, right? But I think when Christians that are addressing false gods, I'm going to use that phrasing, right? 
doesn't mean false as in isn't real. It means false as in not worthy of worship. And I think that that's that nuance is super relevant to well, the broader to the broader cosmology of of well, yeah, and that's, and that's why I mean to, Satan himself, right? right? Yeah, and that's that's why to clarify, I mean, by the time of the New Testament, the 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 Canaanite storm god Baal is identified with with Satan. Um, the Canaanites worshipped Baal as the storm god. Right. Um, they worshipped him as the personification of the storm, just like they worshipped Ishtar as, as the 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 fertility goddess, the 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 the, femi- the personification of the earth and of female sexuality. Um, <clears throat> the Greeks worshipped Apollo as the sun god. Now there were there were beings that were there were supernatural beings that that might have interact that might have interacted with humans and accepted worship as these personified forces of nature, but they were not personified forces of nature. There was sort of like a there was there was a fictional narrative on the ground that humans had that they applied to these supernatural beings, but the supernatural beings were not were were not the gods they were thinking of. They weren't actually nature taking on agency where, where they could right. control the weather it was by it was it bail. was potentially an elohim that was able to wield the power of nature which again it's it's a to, at some level i think what am i trying to say i'm trying to make a point to say that i i agree with what you just said that nature doesn't just do this thing on its own right but at the same time, the ability of a supernatural entity to bend that nature exists also, right? Like th- that existence well, or that ability doesn't, doesn't, it, and, and none of those things are go to say that, you know, that means well, y- Yahweh doesn't exist or Yahweh isn't supreme. That's, that's the, I think that's where this becomes yeah. a complicated conversation. And I, I, you know, I don't know what the specific powers of angels and demons are in terms of the weather, right. but, but the consistent message throughout the Bible is that um, Baal is no God at all. Like there's the famous showdown between Elijah and the prophets of, of Baal, um, the, uh, the Northern kingdom of Israel, they had turned aside to Baal worship under the leadership of King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Um, they had killed all the prophets of the Lord, and then uh, Elijah summoned all the prophets of Baal to, uh, I think it was to Mount Carmel, um, and challenged them to build an altar mm-hmm. and make an offering. And to uh, the, the God who answers by fire is the true God. And right. so they they pr- they prayed to Baal, and and nothing ever nothing happened. And then he he uh, he laid his offering on the altar, and he doused it in water and pray to Yahweh and then lightning consumed the offering. And the point is that Baal has had no power. Um, the really the takeaway in the moment was that Baal, as the, at least as they conceived of him, didn't exist. There, there was no, there was no being named Baal controlling the weather. The figure of Baal came to represent the devil leading people away from Yahweh. Um, and so Baal existed in that sense, but the sense of, Baal as a personified force of nature, as as the personified storm, as Thor and Indra and Zeus um, are also con- are identically conceived. Those those gods just don't exist because nature doesn't have agency. So um, so I mean that's 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 a that's a take, right? I, I I would suggest there's a couple of different ways that could have happened, right? I mean, what if, what, what could have happened? The story you just relayed, right? Okay, so. There's there's the possibility that there was an angel, an Elohim, that what that would happen to wait till a couple of quasi supernatural fire events happened and then took credit for it, right? And said that was me. You should worship me. And they were like, oh crap, he you know he made that happen um, when it could have been you know just natural natural naturally occurring through chaos or whatever, or there could have been an Elohim that was able to wield and manage fire to a certain degree. But in that instance, Yahweh silenced him so that he couldn't to prove his supremacy, right? Like that's also a completely plausible possibility of what happened there. Well, uh, and, and, and either of those two things lend themselves to the same final outcome, right? 
Like that, I, I guess my point is, is I struggled to take a, an event and then back chain. Well, the only way this could have happened is this. Well, no, there's a whole bunch of ways it could have happened. Well, and as I'm long not, as I'm not as long those as kinds of speculations, though, I'm I'm just going with what the text says. And I I, I get it, but the text it was meant to be <clears throat> simple to understand, right? I don't think the text was designed to teach us about the divine council and about the the intricacies of the multi levels of Elohim that some are yeah, following and, and some and not all that not kind everything stuff, happening right? in the Bible is necessarily tied to the divine council though. The consistent That's message true. throughout the Bible is that these gods that the the the, the nations are worshiping the idols, they're these personified forces of nature. They don't exist, but on the other hand, there is the divine council. There there are these. The, these territorial rulers, but like when you read the book of Daniel and um, the messenger comes to him, to, to Daniel, to, uh, to give him a prophecy. And he mentions how he was resisted by the Prince of Greece and the Prince of Persia. And no one came to his aid, except the, the, the great, the chief Prince of your people, Michael, he doesn't refer to the Prince of, uh, he doesn't refer to the prince of Greece as Zeus or the prince of Persia as uh, Ahura Mazda um, or any of the gods that were worshipped by those people. They're just the prince of Greece and the prince of Zeus. Like mm -hmm. there's no acknowledgement of, of of a correspondence of identity between their between their mythological pantheon and the actual divine being who is prince over that nation. Um, so you know, to the, to the apologetic standpoint, um, you know, the, those four arguments, uh, th they don't lend themselves to belief in, in multiple gods and anything resembling polytheism or pantheism. Um, they only lend themselves to the, to the one God and whether or not those other God, those lesser gods of the divine council exist, well, that's, that's, that's something that we take on faith in the authority of the scripture it's not something that we could you could argue for deductively. Mm. Hmm. I don't I don't know that I agree with that, but I don't think that's worth digging into today, tonight because we're going to get so far off topic. We'll never we'll never close right. out. Well, you guys want to move on to the resurrection, or yeah, let's move on. Yeah. Although quickly, I, I'd point out you mentioned uh, Ahura Mazda. I, I I ended up falling into a little. Zorast Zoroastrian Zoroastrianism, however the hell you sure. pronounce that one. Zoroastrianism. Um, yeah, into that little rabbit hole. And apparently that dude, Ahura Mazda, was the the um the loose um inspiration for the uh the fire god in Game of Thrones. I found that to be interesting. The, the Lord of the Lord of Light? No, the Lord of yeah, the 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 Red Witches dude. Yeah, that's the Lord yeah. of Light. Yeah. Yeah, um, that, that he was he was the he was it was loosely based on the Zoroastrian dude, um, and apparently there's also some heavy argumentation that that uh, was actually the first monotheistic religion. But whatever. yeah, I I <laughs> that's the theory is that the Jews got a lot of their ideas for God and Satan from the Zoroastrianism, but. Uh, I, I don't I think you could I think you could just as uh I think you could more persuasively argue it the other way around, but um it just depends on which one <laughs> which one existed first, right? They've got this one going back to uh seven thousand BC. Uh well seven thousand BC is before you mean seven hundred BC? Nope. Oh, I'm sorry, second millennia BC, two thousand. Um well, it's it's hard to determine like when what was written and what it, and what influenced what, but Zoroastrianism is dualistic, which is mm -hmm. um, logically self-refuting. Um, pictures Ahura Mazda and uh, Ahriman, um, I think that's the name of the the god of evil. Pictures them as etern as kind of a yin and yang type eternal equals and opposites um but if one of them is good and the other one is evil that necessarily that necessarily means that one of them is in the right relationship to some higher standard by which he is determined to be good and the other one is in the wrong relationship because evil is doesn't have an existence of itself it's only the 
perversion of or distortion of good. And so, but anyway, that's a <clears throat> that's a whole other argument. There's a great essay on uh, by C.S. Lewis on why dualism is uh, is self refuting. I can send you guys and later, and I can link it in the sure. comments. Yeah, but... we, we can put it in the comments. Yep. All right. So well, let's uh, talk about the resurrection now that we've gone so far yeah. astray. I'm not sure we, we know which um, way's up. Christianity. What are we, wait, what? <laughs> what are we talking about? Yeah. About some ancient gods and Game of Thrones and <laughs> all all over the place. But it, so so you're sure that the resurrection happened, Brian. You're sure I'm, this I'm sure of it, yeah. How 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 can you be so sure? Well, let's see. Um, it is a matter of indisputable historical fact that the original disciples of Jesus, at the very least, claimed to have collectively, empirically, and repeatedly encountered him alive again after his public execution and burial. Like that's a that's a fact. Um, and if you guys are that's it, it shouldn't be a controversial fact but i find that sometimes it is so i can i, I think can it is for the... for most people to be honest yeah it is it is a, it is a controversial fact yeah okay. because um i mean some some objections are what uh what what constitutes a sighting um you know is it was it a was it a vision um were people so distraught over the over the death of their dear leader that they that they had this vision um well, even that... Even Paul, when he mentions okay. when when he sees him, that uh, you know it's it's unutterable of of what he saw, right? So, by the way, um, when you said we don't let, don't ever use dear leader when you're talking about Jesus again, because I suddenly have like Kim Jong Il visions in my head. <laughs> I'm seeing a little dumpy North Korean man. Anyway, anyway it's not. It's not yeah, I, you know what? I want you to censor that. <laughs> that I didn't say that. I want you to put. It... <laughs> It's like a, I like to I like I'm, to picture Jesus as a, right. as, a, as a North Korean <laughs> dictator. Yeah, that's if I just put that have a, the dark Korea peninsula with Jesus over the top. Of I like it. to picture him but, as a. As but a Korea has that has that samurai. super Jack Jesus that's like hanging on the cross. Yes, yeah. Korean Korean Jesus is yoked. Korean Jesus is jacked as shit. So, so South Koreans are awesome Christians. <laughs> he's got like he takes trend. So I mean, my man is he doesn't okay. need trend because he's he doesn't need it. He's so. Dead. By the by, the time of and, Jesus, and this is not me. I'm I'm giving you objections, Brian. I get it. Yeah, so, I get yeah. it. Um, well, let me let me let me make my opening statement here first, and then you'll kind of get a better sense of where to where to, where to, where to lodge ago. your objections. What's that? But your opening statement was 45 minutes ago. <laughs> well, this is the opening. This is an opening statement for the <laughs> resurrection part. for part okay. two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there is that fact that they made this claim. Um, it was a, a that it was a they made it collectively, it was an empirical experience, and it happened repeatedly. Um, and Christianity would not exist but for this claim. From the fact of that claim, it absolutely necessarily logically follows that one of three things has to be true. Um, and this is true of any claim to empirical experience, whether it's uh we saw the risen Jesus. I saw Bigfoot. I got abducted by aliens. The the gnomes in my garden are talking to me. Whatever it is, you can you can run or the angel Gabriel appeared to me and told me I'm the pro, I'm the prophet of a new religion. Um, I see. Either the person is what's that? Nothing. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, he, he just made the comment spicy that you just threw um, in a, a a nice little you know blanket refutal of of Islam as you did a drive by. I didn't refute yeah. it. I just said this is this was a this is, this this is, is a, an example. This of is one a, of the things that makes it a fact, right? Like, it, it, he claimed it as an empirical experience. Um, now, whenever this happens, um, the person is either lying. Uh, they they sincerely believe it, but they're mistaken somehow. Or it actually happened. Um, pretty much every every claim to empirical experience, it, it, it one of three one of three things is true. Right. It absolutely necessarily logically entails one of those three things about it. Um, if it's one person saying it, you can easily write it off as he's crazy. Um, if it's twelve people doing it, it gets a bit harder. 
Um, but uh, if we, one of those has to be true and only one of them can be because they're, they're mutually exclusive. Um, and applying the rules of logic, if we can eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Um, sufficient, I would, and I would argue that sufficient evidence exists that if we were to posthumously put the apostles on trial for the crime of fraud, for lying about the resurrection, we could prove they had neither means, motive, nor opportunity to lie about it. Um, regarding option two, if they, uh, in the past 2000 years, no plausible scenario has ever been proposed for how they could have honestly believe this happened but been mistaken well i've, well, I've heard i've heard uh, what is it mass hysteria right right well hold on but I, I just we'll get to that um i'm just running through the this is the opening statement i'm just kind of summing okay. it up for you um and that leaves option i, I, just, I just got overruled like yeah. overruled you'll get yeah, your chance you're... to cross <laughs> exactly um and that leaves option three and the only the only reason to rule that out um, is if you start out with a philosophical pre presupposition against God existing. And if you start out already knowing God doesn't exist and can't raise the dead, then option three emerges as the best option. But if you don't, if, if you're philosophically neutral um, and you go through the evidence, that that's the only logically permissible conclusion. Well, and that's um, why that's why. In, in the first opening, I made the point that going through those other four to pre-soften the conversation then makes this a much more productive dialogue, right? Right. Yeah. It, yeah. If you've if you've gone through those arguments and air, air and shaping the the, uh, the the uh, the AO, if you will, I don't know what that means. Bombing the shit on out of people before the uh, boots hit the ground. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Um, Air shaping kinetically. Okay, right. I've been out of the Marine Corps for a while. Um, Naval gunfire, if you will. Gotcha. Um, but it's also I what I call it's also what I call it when you use a porta potty and you drop a bunch of toilet paper first. I'll probably shaping. edit that out. Did yeah, that's that's shaping. So that way, whenever you <laughs> kinetically drop, it doesn't splash back. I'll edit that. No that need to edit. That's 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 a fact. That's true. I that's, mean, it's it's I a technique, that, and it's it's a must. To be and there. anybody who's you know at the next uh, you know Burning Man or whatever, you know, that's that's a technique you should lose. You should, you should you use should, that you technique. Should air shape. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, which is it with with our apostles, Brian? Which which is the logical one? Um, I'm so lost right now. <laughs> what are we talking about? What are we What are we doing right now? We're so, still talking I about mean, what you're talking about. They they either they either believed it, or they lied about it, or they were mistaken about it. Right. Right. Is right, that where we are? Right. Well, okay. okay. Either they lied about it, they were they were they sincerely believed it, but were mistaken, or it really happened. Um, and what's interesting is when in Luke's gospel, when Jesus is presented at the temple, there's a there's a prophet there named Simeon who tells Mary that. Uh, this child will be destined to cause the, the rising and falling of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts are revealed. And I find that this is true when you, when you make the case for the resurrection, um, the kinds of objections that you get for it, it tends to reveal the, the person's biases. Um, Cause there's like, there's really no way to escape concluding that he really did rise from the dead and therefore God exists um, unless you resort to some kind of, uh, you know, a, an anti-supernatural bias. You have to start out already knowing God doesn't exist in order to arrive at, uh, to, to eliminate option three and to make the other two seem more plausible. So hang on, which hmm. uh, it, is that true though? So what if your pushback was simply you don't believe words that were written 2000 3000 years ago um well it's not a matter it's not a question of how long ago they were written down it's a question of how long after the event were they written down no um i i don't i don't agree with that with that with that with that uh, premise 
So I mean, what makes something what makes something less how does something get less credible over time? Over time. So as an example, um when I'm watching the local weather and they say, you know, the record heat uh hottest day ever recorded was 112 degrees back in 1846. And I'm like, that's bullshit. Like I don't believe your thermometer from 1846. Like there's no way you can convince me that some 1846 hee-haw farmer had as accurate a unit of measurement as the thermostat at the airport um well they're not using people reading thermometers back then as they're the way to measure it they're looking at like rings and trees and uh okay. ice core samples and yeah. stuff and like i that. don't and i don't believe that they're that their scientific ninjutsu is the same as the way we read temperature today yeah but that's not really the the same thing though i mean you're you're uh, not you're not get but let's just say that that is a, a good example that it is based on uh and, and, well some, i'm not i'm, a, I'm, a I'm trying to reading a temperature I, i'm just trying to I, we don't have to go into the rabbit hole of how temperatures read my point is you're telling me are you telling me that in 1846 some hee-haw dude measured temperature then he wrote it down and then somehow that piece of paper has been undisturbed and hasn't been altered, hasn't been translated, hasn't been converted from Celsius to Fahrenheit improperly and then converted back again. And then now you're going to use that as a basis of measurement that I'm supposed to believe and take to heart. Well, why, like what, I, I think the burden would be on, if if they had, I don't even know when the, the modern mercury t- thermometer was invented. I, I'm using it as an allegory. That. Uh, but right. you, you you can tell what I'm getting at. But, the but it, if there's not any particular reason for, I mean, I mean that that's not really a, an argument for why calling him some hee haw dude. Um, that doesn't really explain why he wouldn't be credible to write down the temperature and why that like how time would like what's the expiration date on on a historical testimony. Like, I don't know. Like I, I don't know. I just, I just was presented with a theory <clears throat> that it's actually only 1876 right now, because back in some era, some emperor, phantom, phantom time hypothesis. Yeah. Some emperor wanted to be the emperor at 1000. Phantom AD. time hypothesis. Yeah, Dre, listen to this. Listen what to this. Fuck are we so, talking about? so Brian, so Brian's heard of it, right? Yeah, so there's a theory that some Roman emperor, was taking over his rule and it was like i'm gonna it was eight something ad and he thought it would be cool to be the emperor at the millennia so he literally just told everybody change all the records to say it's 1000 ad and because they didn't have the internet and they didn't have telephones and only so many people could read and write he just decreed the time to be the, the date to be altered and the date was altered and it's actually 1870 something right now. We don't know. I am Bill Clinton and I am the Y2K president. Like, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, and then so, and Bush is like, nah, nah, rewind a few months. Yeah. I'm now the Y2K president. Yeah. Look at me. So I'm the Y2K does, president now. How does this support your argument, Matt? My point is, is if theories like that can exist, that we don't even know what the actual date is. But nobody takes that. I mean, nobody takes that theory seriously. It's it's been thoroughly debunked. There's like one person in the world who believed it for like five minutes, and then I, everybody. I, don't know. I, I guarantee there's more than that right this second because it's there making are people its rounds who believe right the now. Earth is flat. But there's more. Not... I bet there's more people that believe it's 1876 than that believe the Earth is flat. The point I'm trying to make, I'm being flipped purposefully, right? But the point I'm trying to make is there is a group of people. And I'm not saying I'm in that group or not. I'm saying there is a group of people that have no ability to accept that the words written and the thing that we call the Bible are the same words that were written down 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. And more importantly, that whatever translations have happened have kept the, the, the intent intact of what was said. So, well, the point, the point of all of that is, is that's, okay. a, that's, that's, that's another wrinkle to the, to the, to the big three of your well, hypothesis. Th- those people is would it... be, would, would be, be delighted to learn that there is a science called textual criticism that, uh, that examines ancient manuscripts to see how, if they've changed, how they've changed. And 
the fact of the matter is we have more manuscript support for the 27 books of the New Testament than, and by leaps and bounds, than any other ancient writing in the world. Um, if the New Testament isn't reliable, if we can't, if we can't be assured that what we have today in the New Testament is what was written down, then we have to throw out all history because nothing compares to the, you know, it's often been compared to the telephone game. You guys know Mm -hmm. the telephone game where you sit in a circle and somebody whispers a phrase and the one of my favorite things to do when it was rainy outside for recess in the second grade. And then the next person whispers the, uh, what they think is the, what they heard. And then it goes around the circle. And by the time it comes to the end, uh, it's so distorted that it's it's funny and everybody laughs because. Um, but inevitably, in that telephone game, almost every time there's that little boy who's kind of a dick, and he purposely and he changes it, it on purpose. Yep, right. That didn't happen with the New Testament. Um, when you've got, you know, but I think that there is more of a telephone game in the New Testament when we talk about sides of conversation. So um, if you do any well, kind of... Hold, let me let me finish this point first. Okay, go the, ahead. Just to, to address Matt's uh, objection here. Um, well, first, let me, let me state specifically what I'm basing this fact on. You guys have heard me talk about uh, 1 Corinthians 15. It, it's, it's, it's probably one of the most important apologetics passages. It's where Paul says... Uh, Kind of a, a pre-Pauline creed. <clears throat> right. Um, he says, now, brothers, I, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, um, that the Messiah died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, and he talks about his calling and how uh, he worked harder than all of them, but then he then he concludes with, whether then it was I or they, this this is what we preached, and this is what you believed. Um, right. So, so that, that's kind of debunking the the mark was written after the destruction of the temple because Paul is saying according to scripture, which means that it would be the gospels themselves, right? No, not that's not what he means by according to scripture. Uh, he means according to the the, the Hebrew scriptures, the the prophecy that uh, it would the, happen. Right. Right, but the, what's important here, though, for for the the purposes of this, this is a this is a creed that he received, um, and that the Corinthians themselves also received from Paul, um, and he also says whether then it was I or they who who are the they he means he means the people named in that creed to whom Jesus reportedly appeared, Cephas, the twelve, the five hundred, James, all the apostles. Um, and also rewind a bit to the start of the epistle. He, he uh, af- after all of the the you know the cu- the customary greetings and salutations, he starts the he starts off his letter by kind of laying into them because they're forming cliques around which apostle or teacher had initiated them in, into the faith. It's reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is some say I follow Paul, others I, I follow Peter, others I follow Apollo, still others I follow Christ. Um, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Um, and then he spends the next few chapters kind of reiterating that it doesn't matter which of us initiated you. We all taught you the same message. Uh, it, it, it We're all just workmen. Um the gospel is the same regardless of, of who it is. And so, and also, and then later on in chapter nine, he makes an off the cuff remark about the travel habits of, of Cephas and the Lord's brothers. And so, and, and just to reiterate, I'm not reading this as scripture. Um, we can go into this completely philosophically neutral. Right. This is just, this is just a letter written by a guy in the first century to a community, to a religious community about their beliefs. From, from this letter, we can establish that, that Christ uh, 
his resurrection appearances were claimed by by Cephas, by Paul, by the twelve. Um, the Corinthians met Cephas, Peter. Um, Peter himself preached that to them. Um, and if we if we take that along with the rest of the New Testament, just as a as a snapshot into early Christian belief, we can establish beyond any reasonable doubt that this was the claim that they made, that, that the, the collective empirical repeated appearances of Jesus to his, to his first disciples was claimed by his disciples themselves. And we have, we have such um, wide ranging manuscript evidence of first Corinthians among, among every other book of the Bible. But just if we're focusing our attention on that alone, like Paul wrote that to the Corinthians, they read it, they made copies, they made several copies and distributed them to other churches so they could read them. They made copies. And so generation after generation, you have thousands upon thousands of manuscripts of first Corinthians um, so that you can, you know, a copy of First Corinthians from uh, from Rome. You can you can compare it to a copy in Antioch or Alexandria to to see if there's any changes, and there really aren't any. There's not anything significant. So the idea, so the burden would really have to be on somebody who claims that that's been changed. Who says we can't be sure of it. Um, that what was written, what was originally written is what comes to us today. There's, there's really no good reason to believe that. Um, somebody who says that is just, they're not, they're not familiar with the matter. Um, it's, so it's not really a valid, it's not really a valid objection. Um, so, uh, yeah. Did, did that, are you still with us, Matt? No, I'm with you. I was just, I was listening. I mean, I, I look, I, I, I get it. Um, I, I tend to agree with you. Like I said, I, this, this was me stating other objections, right? So I was yeah. simply throwing that out that that's another objection to your three um, that to say, Hey, look, like, how do we know the words are even accurate? Like, I don't have to, have been, they don't have to have been wrong or right. Maybe they never even said it. How do I know they said it? Right. Like that's the point of that. Yeah. Um, and, would would you say that that answers that objection though i think it i think it addresses it i don't know if it answers it um and I, really like i, I, the I think the reason i the reason i say it that way the reason i say addresses not answers is i i, I don't know if i agree with the last thing you said that the burden of proof is on them i don't i don't know if i agree with that because if you present me with a book and you say this is all accurate and i go no, it's not. How, why do I know that? I don't have to disprove the book that you handed me. Well, like the burden of proof is on you. You're the one it, that handed me the book. Well, right? I'm saying if if they're making the claim that that has been changed, um, then yeah, I think the I think the burden is on them to to. And, and again, I'm assuming that if somebody yeah, is I, asking these questions, they're approaching it in good faith. They're like, I, they're, I agree. They're not, yeah. I agree. They're not being a troll. They're not just Very doing well. it to go. Uh, uh-uh, I don't believe okay. you. But, I, but I, 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 I agree that it, the, the burden of proof would be on whatever textual skeptic to say that those were not transcribed properly or the, the words didn't change. I, so now whether whether or not the words were accurate is not the same argument. I, what what do you mean by that? That's, by that's, by did they say it? Is is that who wrote that and 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 why? And then also. So we have a letter that was probably written in the fifties, and then, but that's only a single the fifties A.D. not the the fifties in, in the fifties, okay? <laughs> because that's that's when America was great in the fucking fifties. So, back when Paul wrote Corinthians. Back when Paul wrote Corinthians <laughs> in the fifties. That's why I said that's the that's the generation of our Lord right there. <laughs> um, but but uh, and where I'm going with that is that then the rest of the new testament kind of fell in line so a lot of a lot of bible scholars will say that the new testament starts with paul's letters is the earliest things that we have and then people uh kind of created their theology around what was trending at the moment and what what paul what paul wrote so well what do you mean by trending at the moment the the claims 
Now, well, just because just because there was claims doesn't mean that it was written in a way that the claims actually happened. All right, let me let me back up a little. Um, if if we look at First Corinthians just as an example, and his, his, him citing the the creed, um, him reference his references to to Cephas and Apollos, and so again, they're forming cliques around which which apostle or teacher had initiated them. We're we're assuming that. Because of, because of why he wrote it in in his well and that's, and that's where I was no that's where I was going with the telephone game right so we don't have we don't have the Corinthians letter to Paul and what Paul was like what the no I'm, right right hey. right well, you know and and we well, also we also don't I mean I'm I'm positive that Paul wrote more than seven letters or thirteen letters sure right? there, so you know we have selected ones maybe there's a third Corinthians or maybe there's a or maybe the first Corinthians is third Corinthians. So that, I'm just saying that, but, 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 so what does that mean? What, if, what if there are, it, it, it means that what, what else was addressed? What else, what other questions did the, did the, that community have? Well, and are, but, okay, and, my, and, and my are point, those questions significant to what we believe is theology? Well, but we're not, we're not worried about his theology per se right now. What, what are the question that concerns us is, is what was early Christianity? What, what, what did they, how did it start? What did they believe? And if we look at First Corinthians, for example, it gives us a snapshot into that community. And it wasn't sure. It, it obviously wasn't limited to the city of Corinth. This is that, but it, it reflects the the overall practice of um and the and that you can get from Roman writers. Like if we uh if we're asking what early Christians believed, how it started, what their claims were, um, in read writers like uh, Tacitus, um, he talks about how uh, he's talking about the Great Fire of Rome, ha which happened in 64 AD, and Nero was blamed for it. And he reports, how, and anybody with the interest in this can 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 see this for themselves that they just google tacitus on jesus there's a wikipedia entry that keep that that homes in on that this one passage that i'm talking about tacitus was a roman writer he lived in the uh first century early second century um he's pretty credible so he's writing about the great fire of rome and how nero emperor nero was blamed for it um because Nero had some plans to renovate big a huge portion of Rome, and he wanted to, he built a temple to himself. And this and is the, the famous the Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Exactly, yeah. Event. Um, so he was blamed for that, and to get to distract from that, he 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 used Christians as a scapegoat. Tacitus describes them as a class hated for their abominations. So by the sixties, Christian Christianity is large enough that they're considered a class. And they have a bad, they have a reputation. They're they're hated for their abominations. And he explains because they how were they cannibals, their, um, <laughs> the, among other things. Yeah. Well, atheists predominantly from it, right by the by the Romans views. Right. And, and and these things are the are the things that uh, they kind of well, wipe out the argument of of the Bible is uh, is circular and it's so. How do you know this happened? Well, because the Bible says so. Well, how do they know? Because the Bible says so. No, there uh, plenty. The younger wrote plenty of stuff on them. Right. You know, of course, Josephus wrote so his shit. Tacitus tells and us Tacitus. that Christians got their name from from Christus, who suffered the extreme penalty under Pontius Pilate um, because of a mischievous superstition that he he taught and the. the the mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment broke out again and then spread out from Judea and reached as far as he's Rome. Mischievous. He's mischievous. Now he's Loki. <laughs> yeah. So he doesn't, he doesn't tell us what the mischievous superstition was, but they tried to stop it by crucifying Jesus. And then uh, that didn't stop it. His, his disciples were undaunted by the threat of persecution, but, uh, but undaunted by the threat of crucifixion. And so Christianity spread and the the picture we get of what that mischievous superstition was and how it spread was the original disciples of Jesus they traveled around the Mediterranean world preaching the the content of 1 Corinthians 15 about Jesus's resurrection that he had been crucified for their sins according to the scriptures and and rose again and appeared to them and apparent gave them all the same sets of instructions to go out and bear witness and make disciples of all nations 
passing on his teachings. Um, and uh, so they did this and they were, they were typically itinerant preachers, uh, Peter, the other apostles. Um, so these teachings about Jesus were a controlled tradition. It wasn't just something that was trendy at the time. It was, it, it, it was the, the accounts of Jesus's life and the, the, the uh, retelling of his teachings from the mouths of the apostles that made up early Christian teachings. And so the picture that we get from first Corinthians uh, is they made these claims of physical bodily resurrection. And by the time of Jesus, the concept of resurrection was pretty well defined um, from passages like uh, Daniel 12, where he, where he, uh, he receives a vision in which the angel tells him that uh, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, will rise some to everlasting life, others just to shame and everlasting contempt. And then there's the Ezekiel 37 of the Valley of dry bones that God commands them to come back to, for, to, uh, for sinews and muscles and organs and skin to reconnect themselves to the bones and they get back up again. And this is, it's a metaphor for Israel as a nation, but also a prophecy about physical bodily resurrection. And you kind of see that hinted and alluded to or outright foretold throughout the old Testament, which is why modern Jews believe in a physical bodily resurrection. And so that they were claiming that, um, that this happened to them, that, they, that that Jesus appeared to them, um, you really can't get away from that as a fact of history. If if somebody ha is inclined to dispute that, the fact that they made the claim, well, you really need to find some other way to account for the for the start of Christianity. Um, and when you try to when you try to do that, you kind of there's there's not really another an alternative view. So. Um, Sounds like a closing statement more than it does an opening one. Well, the fact that they claimed it does not in and of itself prove that it happened, but it gives us our... Uh, so what does make it true? Um, well, again, so if we can establish that as a fact, again, it necessarily logically follows that one of those three options is true. Um, and so if we consider, well, by process of elimination, which... which uh, well, what can we eliminate? Um, we consider, did they lie about it? Um, well, again, we can we can prove from the evidence that they had neither means, motive, nor opportunity to lie about it. Um, as Tacitus said, they uh, they showed up in the very city in which Jesus was crucified, proclaiming the resurrection, and they had a lot of Christian apologists. I, I think irresponsibly overstate this like like in josh mcdowell's more than a carpenter which is a great book i love it everybody should read it but he he makes the claim that every, like all of the apostles to a man other than john what was, was martyred and i think that he goes he even goes so far as to say that what they they could have uh they could have saved themselves by recanting at any time, but they didn't. And who would die for a lie? I think that's an overstatement. I, I think so too, which is why I don't I don't know if I fully subscribe to the means, motive, or opportunity to well, lie. But what is true is that I mean Jesus was crucified. That's a that's a fact. Nobody would just okay. that. Crucifixion was done as a deterrent. It was the worst thing that could happen to you and they did it as to basically as a public statement that if like don't do what this guy did or this will happen to you so weeks after jesus's crucifixion his disciples show up in the very city in which it happened proclaiming his resurrection and so they had every reasonable expectation of meeting with the same fate there's good reason to believe that some of them if not a lot of them did meet with that fate um but we don't need to prove that to because we already know they had a reasonable expectation of meeting with that so what what would have motivated them to lie about it um i i, I don't know you can, we can say the same thing about a lot of modern martyrs i okay, mean like like give me an example uh david koresh okay so what what was his claim that got him killed uh, okay a better example joseph smith 
Okay. Well, he was shot in jail for scamming people. Um, that, that was the claim. Really? I mean, I'm that's, not, that's, I'm not, I don't that's care. Not, no, he was first, first he was, he was dragged outside and tarred and feathered okay. him and, and the people that claimed to see what he saw. And right. then, and then he was arrested for that. And then a mob came and killed him and never did he recant. So well, he died believing in what it is that he saw and moved forward with. Well, knowing that that could have been his fate he, and at any time he could have recanted. Okay. So, and you think that's the same thing as the apostles showing up in Jerusalem where Jesus had been crucified, proclaiming he had risen from the dead and telling the people who get, who killed him, you killed the Messiah that you think that's the same thing. Like, Joseph, well, I mean, if like, we're like when Joseph Smith started out, did he, did, did he immediately have good reason to think, Hey, someone's probably going to kill me for this. Or did he maybe think, Hey, maybe I can get, did he have maybe, did he think, maybe think he would get powerful? And it was, a, a it was pretty, it, it was pretty, it was pretty early on that, that he was threatened with, with death on a okay. constant basis. Now, but also but then he moved to Utah to get away from it. He did not move to Utah. He was killed. He couldn't move to Utah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know the full story, but right. that, that's why know, they moved to Utah. I do know that he because, had, because they 40... were persecuted in, in Missouri and in Illinois. And then they moved to Utah because okay. the prophet was murdered, but, but also, okay. But he did. No, have no, no, I want to, get... no, I want to, I want to address that. So yes, I think they were because. Be, or or they could, and this is an argument. Wait, I'm not. They, I'm not they, saying they did, but wait, but we they were also them revolting being, you know. them being the Jews that they had their Messiah and they wanted to run Rome out of town. So yeah, they. Well, but you, no, that's that's not what the apostles it, were so, doing though. So if they claimed that the Messiah was killed, wouldn't that rile up some some zealots? Hold, hold back up. You're, you're saying the apostles showed up in Jerusalem to rile up zealots to fight rome i i'm not saying that i'm saying they could have that i'm saying there's a means and motive but why would look they they be... so wait, hold on go go back to what to what you were saying where they why would they show up to a place knowing that that could be their fate right they, they had every reasonable expectation of being arrested and crucified themselves for now you know they didn't have an army behind them. They didn't. They didn't have. Uh, they didn't have the Jewish establishment on their side. They were attacking the Jewish establishment. They like they had zero political power to impose their will on anybody. Right. They showed up in public and basically thumbed their nose at the authorities who had who had crucified Jesus, saying, "You killed the Messiah," um, but God raised him from the dead. So. If why wouldn't they believe that they'd be raised from the dead at, at some point? So well, that's, where, where but that, so but that's where exactly is their fear my, of death? They don't have fear of death. But that's exactly so my that's exactly my point. That doesn't the, make them correct. It, well, it means well, hold, that they have no on. fear of death. Well, yeah, but it, it does make them. It, if if Jesus did not rise from the dead, they knew he didn't rise from the dead. Like if they made it up. Like if, if if Jesus was crucified and then so, like say Peter ran, got everybody together said hey you, you know it would be a good idea let's uh, let's say he let's say he's actually the Messiah because he because he he rose from the dead let if for whatever reason he had that idea he's going to have to sell people on that he's going to have to to convince people of why this is a good idea why this is going to work out for them. Um, now if they, if they, if he didn't rise from the dead, they knew he didn't rise, he didn't rise from the dead. And so they know they're not going to rise from the dead if they get crucified. So if they're making it up, then what's in it for them? Like, what are the, did they, and if you look at any other cult leaders in history, I mean, their, their motivations are not terribly mysterious. You do it to get powerful. You do it to get rich. You do it to get laid. Uh, you do it to get influence. <laughs> um, they didn't get rich. They didn't get powerful. They, I mean, 
the life of an itinerant preacher is not one of luxury and uh and comfort um so you know it, it's pretty hard to establish a motive and in terms of uh opportunity well they're they're telling their stories about jesus involve i mean one it's a public ministry like he's not it, it's not like uh say muhammad who said he he was alone in a cave when an angel came to him and told him he's in charge where you have to take his word for it their stories about jesus are public healings he's uh he's he's preaching openly in the temple people are bringing him sick people and lame people to heal those are the stories they're telling if they're lying about those things they're they're creating a lot of opportunities to be exposed as liars um you don't hear any any of those counter reports um and it's not it's not because of this the the vic the uh victors write the history kind of thing i mean we have we have the writings of jews at the time we have the writings of romans nobody accused them of making things up about jesus when they're when they're telling these public stories about him uh the means um <clears throat> that creed that uh that paul repeated mentions uh 500 witnesses to the risen jesus um does that mean that 500 people to a man showed up to Corinth to, to corroborate his story? It's doubtful. But if there isn't a large number of people who are corroborating that, like the these were uh these are pretty closely interconnected communities. Like you read about in the book of Acts when uh, on the day of Pentecost, how there were pilgrims there from all over the world, from all over the Mediterranean world. Um because that was a regular occurrence, but people from uh, the Jewish diaspora would travel to Jerusalem on a yearly basis. Obviously, not every person went every year, but there was a lot of travel from by Jewish pilgrims to Jerusalem and a lot of correspondence back and forth. So that when when the disciples traveled to the, throughout the Medi Mediterranean world to to build the church, they went to synagogues first. They went to to their fellow Jews who you know, they had that, that communication network going back to Jerusalem. So they didn't really have the opportunity to, to lie about these things. And they didn't have the means to leverage on the order to, to leverage hundreds of people to go along with them, that they can make a claim. Like he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I, Again, if we were to if we were to put them on trial for this in a court of law today, I'm I'm confident that you could you could prove them innocent of fraud um, by showing they didn't have means, motive, or opportunity. I mean, the more you the more you consider the option that they deliberately lied about it, the more the more absurd it it, it becomes. Like it just you can't really. I I don't think anybody can honestly hold on to that claim yeah. that they lied about. I, so I, so I had a I, I've I've actually told this and by the way guys sorry for my video I don't know what happened the camera just like blinked off the camera's on it just won't play anyway I think the best defense or counter argument to the to the uh, New Testament writers misrepresenting what happened is the actual context of their words because none of them wrote in a way that made it look like they expected the resurrection to occur. More importantly, all of them, essentially all of them, all four of them, write the story such that they look like they didn't know it was happening, which is a really dumb way to represent something you knew was going to happen. So I'm, I'm pausing dramatically for a second for that, that concept to soak into everybody that's listening. Right. And uh, I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote my, my current pastor, Brian Ramey. He used the phrase, nobody expected nobody. Right. So when they, when they went to the tomb, they expected there to be a corpse and all of their running and their gyrations and all of the drama that ensued, all the shenanigans was a result of them being caught off guard. 
that's not the way that people would act if they were one expecting it. And that's not the way a person would write a historic document unless you wanted to represent that you didn't expect it. And that's a really weird way to tell a lie. <laughs> right. right. Like, right. like that. And, and it was funny because he told my pastor told that, that he used this on a, the first Easter that I ever attended his church. And that's actually why I still attend his church. Cause I like the way he explained that it, it makes a lot of sense, right? If, if a person was going to weave a, a yarn, they would set themselves up as knowing what was going to happen. And they'd be like, Oh, of course I knew what was going to happen. Cause I'm, I'm Matthew or I'm Luke or I'm Paul, I'm Peter, right? I'm John. Peter didn't write it. I know he didn't write one of the four gospels, but the point is that they would have written it in a way that they looked good. Instead, all of the gospels look like idiots and they look like they didn't believe Jesus. They're like, woman, you're telling me that he's not in there. <laughs> right. Right. Like, and they, now they tell it differently, but that also to a certain degree gives it the, the appropriate level of humanity of what was happening because it was such a wild event. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and I, it's, and it's funny to me because that's, that's one of the primary counter arguments of non-believers is that there's some nuances that don't, aren't perfectly matched. Right. Like in one, there was two women and one, there was four women and there was more women and it was who was on first. And like people get really lost in this minutia because these lines don't perfectly line up. Right. He which was, would be, which would be a good argument if, if they're observation. That would be a good argument, maybe against inerrancy, but it doesn't harm right. the historical. Well, but my, right. my point right. is, my point is like if if the three of us all lived through, you know, a major firefight together, our versions of the firefight would be subtly different. That doesn't change yeah. the fact that the firefight occurred or that the three of us were there, right? Like one of us is going to remember it differently because because of the 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 drama, the fog of war, right? Yeah, and, and I'm the sure perspective. Right. And, and, and those I'm differences sure, prove independent attestation in the I, Gospels. I, I tend to actually be of that opinion. Um, if they were identical, that would actually cause me to question it more. Right. Like if they were perfectly aligned, like, you know, we all watch movies, you watch cop dramas. Right. And there's always, you know, when the cops have a shooting, they always talk about how they've got to get their story straight and they've got to sit down and, and they want to get yeah. on the same page. Well, there's a risk in it being too contrived. Right. And in some of these movies, that's why, you know, internal affairs gets their hackles up whenever the stories are perfect. Um, I, I, so I, 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 as a, as an individual human being, um, I, I, I this actually, in that perspective. I mean, if they were the same, why have all four of them in there? Correct. Why not just have one story? Right. Um, or why not have them all just say, as Matthew said, Right. Like reference the other story. They're like, I'm going with my, my guy. He's, he's a better, he's got a better memory than I do. Whatever he said, I'm going with that. You know, they told their version of it. It was a little bit off. So what? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the big picture. And the important part was the man is still alive. <laughs> that guy that died, he ain't dead. Well, like that's, that's the important part of the he, story. He's alive again. Right. I, yeah. I said he died. Right. Like yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not minimizing right. that he died. Uh, I'm saying that like the, 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 the force for the trees, right? Like, did the man die? Yes. Was he dead? Yes. Did he come back to life? Yes. Wait, what? Like that's, that's all that matters. <laughs> hold, hold up. Hold up. Hold so, up. so yeah, I, I, I find that to be the easiest way to kind of put a bow in that um, from a, you know, what was their intent, all of that. Like, I think that actually wraps it all up really nicely in a really simple, easy to digest story. So props, Brian Ramey for throwing that out there. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think we can safely eliminate option one uh, to account for that fact that they, 45 that they just, minutes later, option one's off that, the table that they just lied about it. Um, option two, um, you mentioned mass hysteria before. Typically, mm -hmm. the the go to is mass hallucination, right? Um, which sounds plausible because because uh, because it sounds kind of similar to mass hysteria, which is a thing that happens. But mass hallucination is not a thing that happens. Um, people don't have collective hallucinations. A hallucination is something that it's 
your 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 mind is generating something that's not there. Unless David Blaine's in the room. But it's I mean, one out of every eight people report, you know, seeing a loved one yeah. after they after they die. And if this was the loved one of loved ones, then you know, why wouldn't one of eight people claim to see him? Yeah, but I mean, there's a couple objections to that. Um, first, no, that um, is the objection. What's uh? Well, no, but there are a yeah. couple of reasons that objection doesn't work. Okay, which is one is like like you said, those are pretty common. That's a thing that's known to happen. Right. No one else in history has taken a grief hallucination as a resurrection. Um, it's typically understood to be like a ghost. Um, and it wears off. It doesn't last for that it doesn't it doesn't sustain 40 years of conviction. Um I don't know. I think I think anyone who has seen a loved one would would stick to that conviction for the rest of their life. I think that if if you were to, you know, talk to a young girl who believes that she saw her grandmother and then 20 years later after that story, she would retell it the same way. Yeah, but she, but she's going to tell it as my grandmother's spirit appeared to me or uh you know, my my grandmother well, appeared well, to me that, from Well, that's 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 because we understand a culture that we're living in today. I don't I don't know if that's the same thing 2000 years ago. Well, but they did have those that that kind of a a culture where they would that they would distinction say that, between a spirit and and a resurrected body, right? Like those like those kinds of things, as you said, are common, but they don't they don't convince people that human that that human history has entered a new stage, um, in which God is God has raised the Messiah from the dead. Um, that oh, that it, if it was a grief hallucination, it's something that, that they kind of would have fit into an existing set of beliefs. Um, you resurrection, think that a Messiah resurrection is an existing set of beliefs for the ancient Jews. Uh, a crucified Messiah is absolutely not an uh, yeah, concur. Uh, I mean, th th that he had been crucified, that was an automatic disqualifier to be the, the Messiah in their view. Um, having a grief hallucination and also they already had a tradition so i, I think that's an important well, point to make to to make because i i don't i don't think that before you said the crucified messiah i, I didn't i wasn't buying it right i mean um, if from a from that from the angle like yeah i think a grief hallucination could be i think that they that they could and and, and you talked about the the culture of uh of believing an, an event if they if they believe in a messiah and they all believe that this guy was the Messiah and he was raised. And yeah, I think that I think enough people would see that. But by him being disqualified as the Messiah, I believe that that is a that's a that's a distinction worth noting. Yeah. For but, that objection. And also they already had a tradition, an established tradition of 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 martyred prophets. Um that they could have easily fit Jesus into and and still held on to some kind of validation of his message without him rising from the dead. Um they could have they could have said he was he was a persecuted prophet along the lines of Isaiah or Jeremiah or Elijah. Uh, but now but he's if, gone. But if, and but if we're just talking of only five hundred in in this I mean the because he was also rejected, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um but um the idea of but uh, you know again the uh also the grief hallucination um well one they would have fit that into an existing belief system um if it was that but also they all heard the same set of instructions like if if you've ever been to a a, a meeting of of church leaders deciding on church business you know they will fight like cats and dogs over the the color of carpet in the sanctuary or uh but here you've got them agreeing on his instructions to them before he ascended. Um, they're in solidarity about the mission of the church. Um, yeah, later on, you have a controversy about whether uh, Gentiles have to convert to uh, to Judaism in order to join the Christian movement. But to even have that 
that argument in the first place, you have to have that prior set of beliefs about what Christianity is, about what their what their beliefs are. And that requires a collective empirical experience of Jesus ap uh, appearing to them and giving them the same sets of instructions. A, a grief hallucination just doesn't doesn't explain that. It doesn't it doesn't account for the, the the fact of that claim and the nature of the claim. Um, so, are there any other objections uh, or or reasons to believe that uh, or or common uh, reasons to believe that uh, that they believed it was true but are mistaken? There's the swoon hypothesis, which is that he wasn't really dead, that he had just oh. lost consciousness. He was mostly on the dead. cross, right? <laughs> mostly dead. And then he, uh, when they laid him on the cool stone slab in the tomb, he revived. And, He's like, oh uh, shit! <laughs> and and with his uh, grievous injuries, he managed to move the stone from the tomb. And oh, travel yeah. across town and and appear. sneak sneak past the 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 legionnaires that were guarding right. it, right? And convince yeah. his disciples that he had conquered death itself. So, um, so oh, a, okay, a, yeah. a, a naked dude with a gushing wound in his in his yeah. in his right. abdomen that had been whipped and was bleeding all over the head and hadn't drank water in three days. In fact, he had a little vinegar. Yeah, <laughs> so, he's just oh yeah, yeah, around. I buy that. Yeah, he just. Well, I mean, the Korean Jesus could have done that. <laughs> so, I mean, only with only with the help of steroids, though. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and then there's the twin hypothesis, which is right. that oh, right. Um, and this is based solely on the idea that um, that the Apostle Thomas uh, or Didymus, Didymus, his name, right. his name means twin, which they take. Oh, that mean that can only mean Jesus is twin. Right, but if Jesus had a twin, and to begin with, um, I mean, his brothers were members of the early church. Um, his, his ministry was in Cana, in in Galilee, where his family lived. He didn't grow up with a secret twin. Like if he had a twin, right. everybody knew he had a twin. Yeah, yeah and, James would have been totally duped on that. Right. <laughs> and so, if one of them was crucified and the other one was still around, they're going to ask, like, "Hey." where's your brother um or, or or his mother who was yeah. you know at the cross i mean having a tw having a twin at all would would probably you would think it would come up yeah <laughs> yeah at some point so basically every attempt to explain how they how they honestly believe this but were mistaken it's more ridiculous than the last the more you the more you run through these scenarios um, the more you, uh, just the harder option too, is to swallow. Um, yeah. well, I'm definitely not like it yet. The swoon option sounds like yeah. the most ridiculous. Now, uh, some people do raise the objection that there are stage magicians who do incredible things that can't be explained yeah. and that like making mean... the statue of Liberty disappear or something like right. that. Yeah. But, um, Ooh, and if he summoned Babylon before he went on the cross, he would have cult sex magic and he would he'd be all uh -huh. he'd be able to uh -huh. he'd be able to pull this come off. On. Oh, come on. That's we're we're gonna that's yeah, we're gonna have absurd. Uh, that's what that is. Yeah. But the thing is like somebody in the world knows how David Copperfield made the Statue of Liberty disappear. Like yeah, magicians same. don't share the secrets for their tricks for monetary reasons. But there's been 2,000 years of incentives for somebody to explain how they pulled off the resurrection as a magic trick. I mean, it's right. not... P P Pendulette would have figured it out by now. <laughs> right. Um, and people have been, you know, have had incentive to debunk Christianity. Uh, no one's been able to replicate it. Um, it's, it's, I mean, if you could, if you could do that and debunk Christianity, you'd be the, the most famous wealthy stage magician ever um but nobody's done that in 2000 years um i think it's the crucifixion part that keeps him from trying well first of all it sounds painful it seems lousy yeah, do you I'm... do you really think that would stop somebody who would i mean yes um maybe they can do it with just uh you know binds 
well, instead of the whole nail thing. I mean, like I've seen, I mean, think about movies, like, you know, there's like flatliners. They damn sure didn't get crucified to test out their theory. Well, if somebody... And they think, were also only dead for like 20 minutes. If somebody thinks they can pull that off, I mean, if somebody can pull that off, I think someone's going to do it. I think they're going to just for the bragging rights. And well, but you my can't point prosecute is, me for murder if I brought the guy back. Right. No, my um, point is, is like the movie Flatliners, you know, I mean, they were dead for a couple of minutes and they were just doing medical recovery from being, you know, clinically dead, whatever. I'm willing to bet that there's people on planet Earth that have pushed that in the secret trials to see what the maximum length is. And my guess is it's somewhere around 30 minutes, <laughs> and right? I, and not I'm, three days is the point. And I'm not saying like a magic trick of actually bringing somebody back from the dead, but the, the, the argument is, well, he didn't really rise. It was, it was an illusion right. like stage right. magic. Right. Okay. Well, what saying... about, what about the objection that somebody else moved the body and then, then they had their grief hallucinations. Um, that uh, it, Joseph Arimathea, for example. Well, that still doesn't account for the claim to empirical experience. Um, it's okay. not that just that the tomb was empty. In fact, they don't even make much of that in the it's implied in the creed, but really it's the appearances to them that's the main that's the main claim that the Messiah that the Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. And it's, it's the, it, and also the emphasis in the creed is that it's something Jesus is doing. It's not Cephas saw him and then the right. 12 saw him and then he saw him. No, he appeared to them. It's something he's doing. And so just the, it's, it's not just a missing body alone wouldn't account for that. It's the, it's the, it's the, 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 repeated claim to collective empirical experience that's that's the main thing you know it would be um, the best the best proof to be able to put all doubters to rest would be if we get a copy of the roman charge sheets for the uh for the guards that would be pretty <laughs> what, cool to have you let that guy go <laughs> <laughs> imagine it's like you know some some <laughs> roman name right like gluteus maximus you're hereby charged with, you know, letting the body the disappear. election of duty. <laughs> right. You said you, you named all the Roman up. guard Gluteus Maximus. Yeah. 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 What yeah. was that? That was history of the world, wasn't it? I don't. I don't know. I haven't seen that. Yeah. I think it was. Okay. I thought you just came up with that. I mean, I had to come up with some Roman sounding name. Some some Latin yeah. sounding name. Yeah. My I went blank, so I went to Gluteus Maximus. Yeah. All right. Well, um, it was actually it was his wife. His wife was Bootius Maximus. Wasn't that it? It was bootyus minimist. Minimist. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know. I, I think that was history of the world. Probably. Because he's given Brooks. like he's given the lecture, and the kids keep laughing because his name was <laughs> Biggest Dickus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wasn't that history of the world? Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't seen it. What? You didn't. That's how we got ten commandments, not fifteen. Because he, he had dropped fifteen it. commandments, and he drops one we of have them. The shatter. Ten commandments. Ten commandments. <laughs> That's a Maybe really good it. movie. You, I cannot believe you haven't watched that, Brian. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's as good as Holy Moses. I, I, I mean, I haven't seen there. that either. You but, didn't see uh, Holy Moses? Dudley Moore run around thinking he's he's Moses. No, I haven't seen it. Oh, that's too bad. Sorry. Um, you should you should check that out. So, stop watching all these stupid comic book movies. Okay. Um, Tell me they so, don't suck all right so so that so that leaves with the third option that it actually happened huh i think i think that's what it looks like yeah hmm. um son of a <laughs> spoiler alert <laughs> by process of el of elimination um and re i mean really there's if the resurrection didn't happen if and somebody wants to reject it then <laughs> um they gotta either they gotta make the case for how they could have been honestly mistaken or make the case for why they would have lied about it and how they managed to leverage hundreds of people as uh as witnesses and how they uh oh uh, i've got another argument for not against ooh. okay besides besides just the <clears throat> historical case so and i don't want to start a whole new rabbit hole but it's 
even people like Bart Ehrman uh, agree that the individual, the historical person of Jesus Christ existed, right? Like that's really not arguable, even by atheists for the most part. There's the other argument that he wasn't, that was he who he said he was, right? And in what sense? The son of God. Okay. Right. He he declared himself the son of God. He said, I am right. Um, and there's all the different, you know, it talks about he references the being the son of man and all that stuff. And I'm not yada, yada, yada. And I'm trying to get to the point quickly. There's, there are people like, like some Jews that are like, oh yeah, Jesus, he was a really good guy. He was a nice man. He was a good prophet, but he wasn't the son of God. Well, the problem is if he said he was the son of God, you have two options. He Some either liar, lunatic. He, he either was the son of God, or he was a freaking liar and a blasphemer. Which means that he's not a good guy. He's not a good guy. Like last <laughs> time I checked, liars and blasphemers are not considered good guys. So that yeah. becomes very binary, right? It's it, there's not a third option, yeah. unless he was mistaken. Yeah, right? like, and that's <laughs> that's basically the the argument that I was making with the apostles, except I I, right. I shifted it to them. Yeah, like, no, that's that's why I that's why I wanted to bring yeah. this back home, right? I, I I got your back on the important things, um, that it, it, he either was or he wasn't, and if he was, then he was, and we're done having the conversation, right? Yeah, and if you say he wasn't, then you have to say that this man who existed was the most pathological blasphemer known to man right like so then you have to say okay he was this evil person which means you can't walk around saying he was a good guy and then all of the other good things that are attributed to him and all of the um positive preachings that he did you have to you have to discredit which becomes a very different you know uh falling action from from that position stance that that position so when you yeah. juxtapose he either was who he was or he wasn't. And then it either happened or it didn't happen. You're kind of done, right? But it, becomes, do those, it, becomes, it becomes a very wrapped up point. Do those Jews believe that he said those things? Yeah, and that's the... the so C.S. Lewis think they sums do. this so, up as the, uh, the Lord, liar, lunatic argument. Like, because he claimed to be the son of God. He's mm -hmm. either... He either is the Lord or he's a liar or he's a lunatic. The fourth option that uh, that skeptics add is legend that he didn't actually make those claims, but um, and they were all attributed to him post mortem, right? Yes. Um, but I mean that's that's predicated that that doesn't really hold up. There's no evidence for that. Well, um, that goes back to the that actually circular back to your point about how much textual <laughs> um, validity exists in the in the scripture, right? So if if we're going to go back to say that all of these things were actually written down by these people, well, I it, mean that's if they're written down by these people. Well, well, yeah. Already... The, the assumption behind that argument of adding the the fourth option of legend is that uh, you know the, the stories about him were kind of passed on in this telephone game fashion mm -hmm. um, and anonymously and embellished in the telling, and so what started out as these sort of sedate stories about a, a faith healer who is a, a good moral teacher but a merely moral prophet well then they snowball to these divine proportions where he's walking on water and claiming to be god um, it was really just like a puddle that he walked across and people were impressed yeah um <laughs> something like that um but there's really no evidence for that i mean that you that assumes that's a certain model that they assume in order to account for the gospels as we find them. Mm -hmm. And that depends on being written down much later, like post 70 AD, but uh, there's not really any good reason to think they were written down that late and very good reasons to think they were written earlier. That some of which we've, we've talked about here. Um, but even if even without the Gospels, if you look at the er, the very earliest traditions about Jesus, like that creed that that was that some scholars place within a few years of the crucifixion, um, you know, if if they're if they're preaching his physical bodily resurrection from the dead from the get go, there's really not any room to to go from there. I mean, there's 
if the earliest traditions have him rising from the dead, then it, it kind of blows the whole thing out of the water. So, uh, but also um, <clears throat> a scholar named Richard Bauckham wrote a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, which I've talked about on here before. Um, he makes a very good case that the, the, um, the content of the gospels are the oral testimonies that the disciples were, were presenting as they traveled around the Mediterranean world, telling people about Jesus. Um, they were, they were told and retold in the same form over and over again by, by that disciple and the job of like the role of the church communities were to, were to listen to this and memorize it. So by the time that it was written down near, um, they already recognized this as material they already knew that they had heard from the very disciple who, who was attributed to in the gospels. Um, so again, that places it very early, but there's also internal evidence for why uh, why the earlier should I should I we talked about that before? Do you think I should review it, or was that would that be boring at this point? I don't or, I don't I don't know if it ties yeah, to this. I don't I don't know. If, yeah, earlier late. I don't know if that's an objection of it being yeah the resurrection it, being true. I think that's a different. I think it's a different angle. I think that's right. a that's a goalpost well, move. That's a move to goalpost defense more than a, a a defense of the original topic from my from my read. Well, if the gospels were written earlier, that means that that precludes legendary embellishment, particularly of the resurrection accounts. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, of the whole thing, but those in particular. But yeah. um, but but I think those are I think those are more spurious objections. They're more of the like. Like I don't want to. We could spend forever take going after every single one of them, right? But I think those. I I think what we hit were the main ones. They're the ones I've always heard, the ones I hear. Yeah, um, the gospels could be written late, and the arguments we made here still hold up because mm -hmm. they don't depend on the gospels. Right. right. But there's no reason to think the gospels were written late, and being written earlier certainly reinforces everything we said here. But it. But yeah, it's not something. That our argument depends on so yeah. um anyway that's why i think christianity is true um uh, jesus rose from the dead and that's the uh that validates him as the messiah and validates the overall biblical narrative that foretold him and uh so there the end hmm. and, and and i i like and to to wrap up what we talked about previously, the historical case, and then the uh, you know the the thing that I threw in about Jesus, you know, being a good guy or a bad guy kind of thing. I I feel like that in of itself, I feel like it's a standalone argument or defense, whichever way you're looking at it from, because I really hate the the argument for for morality. Um, so, why, why? Because just the, we'll, we'll do it on a different show because we're already done. But just the right. idea that morality can't exist if there's no God, I, I, it, it, that's that's so down in the weeds of of philosophy and and premise building based on predetermined ideas, and it's just it's it's ugly. I, hmm. I, I, well, I feel I like think, it. Uh... I feel like it's like asking for a fight for the sake of having a fight rather than trying to make a point. I think it's kind of central to Christianity and to basic civilization. I mean, I think it's, I think it's probably the most important argument for God's existence. Um, I mean, I, yeah, we, we should get into that another day. Let's do it. Let's absolutely. I'd yeah, love to, yeah, I, yeah, I'd love sure. to spend a whole session on that one alone because I, I have strong opinions and feelings on it, but I don't want to, I don't want to go backwards and detract from, I think we actually a, a, addressed a subject in, closed on it in one yeah. show for once and i'd rather take the win <laughs> so, <laughs> so um if, if you're listening or watching and uh and you have other <clears throat> objections to anything that we said uh leave a comment yeah, um, for sure send us send us some correspondence that you know there's our email address will be in the in the in the show notes as well so uh you know lay lay out what what your argument is for 
And and if you have a, an extra argument for why why Jesus' resurrection is true, you know, let us know that too. Um, but if, if you know, if you're a person that that thinks that that didn't happen, well, you know, hey, hey, make your case. We're uh, we're here to listen, and uh, and we can have a, a conversation. We'll engage with you, uh, all three of us on on any of those socials. Um, Absolutely. Yep. And, or if you don't think we uh, covered the defenses or the arguments properly, let us know. Maybe, yeah, maybe, for sure. Maybe, maybe if, we're coming at it wrong or our our understanding is flawed. Let us know about that also. Bring it. Bring it. <laughs> so uh yeah. Um, thank you. If you if you stuck around this long, please remember to hit that uh that subscribe button, maybe a notification bell so that you know that uh you know that we have any any new content. Um throughout the week we'll we'll get little little shorts, you know, from from this show. Uh, and ho hopefully, you know, you see them and, and it leads you back to, to get the full form content. Um, anything to add fellas? No, I, I, I think, think that I, covers I, it, man. I think right we, on. Like so, I said, I think we, I think we closed one out and we, we didn't leave anything hanging. That's, that's, that's pretty wild. Um, so I'll, I, you know, I'll leave you with, uh, you know, stay enlightened, stay curious and we'll catch you next week. Take care. God yeah. bless.